Hello, my friends, and welcome to Everything You Love, episode 37. A while back, I created a little poll where I asked you guys what type of videos you like seeing from me the most. Videos where I'm just playing guitar, guitar maintenance videos, gear demos, unboxings, lessons, or everything you love. And of the 666 of you that voted, the majority of you, 43%, said everything you love. And so here we are, and let's get into some of your questions and comments. First up from Scotty Don't. I love that avatar. Always love seeing that, Scotty. There's so many songs that are based on one or several riffs or ideas, not just Chimera's, but numerous bands who take a simple idea and turn it into a full song. How do you have so much confidence in one riff? I asked Mark once and he said, when you know, you know. It's a great answer from Mark and he's totally right. Great riffs give you a certain feeling and whether you're like bringing it to the rehearsal room to show your other band members or something you come up with on the spot while you're writing, a lot of the time a great riff just gives you a feeling and the confidence to know that it's either gonna be a great chorus or a great intro or a great breakdown and knowing where to utilize that, that best is important. Something that's come up a lot lately and actually something I just covered in my latest quick riffs with Kamira's Let Go is when a riff is special enough, and that's always, you know, in the eye of the beholder, but, uh, or the ear of the beholder, but when you have a special riff, how much can it be used throughout the song? Can it be played over and over again? And, and there's kind of this like Strongsville recipe, Strongsville, Ohio, where we're all from, where a lot of the times in a lot of our songs and a lot of local bands we came up with, we'd take one big riff and just kind of play it in slightly different ways. So like with Let Go, there is the, the main riff. <laughs> single string and we play it with chords. Also another variation. Same riff really, same notes, all that just kind of played different ways. So back to that Strongsville recipe thing, there's a famous guy you've all heard of, Todd Bell, great friend of ours, high school buddy uh, who is also the center photographer for most of Kamira's videos and tons of our photo shoots and all that kind of stuff. You guys have heard me talk about him a million times, but he played in a band, guitar and sang for a band called District 5, who all of our bands, me and Andals and Sanctum, Mark and Jim and Skip Line and Ben Shigal, our producer, who's also in Skip Line, Matt DeVries and Jason Hagar, Kamira's original guitarist. They were in Ascension, all our bands would play around together. But anyways, District 5, uh, Todd Bell's band, they had this song called Bills, I believe it was the first song, maybe on like their second record or something at the time, but it just had one riff that I think was pretty much the theme throughout the entire song. It was like this. So that's how the tune started. They just kind of played it lightly in single string. Then open. Back to the verse. You can be singing during that verse when it's quiet and then they break it back open. And then they do another variation for pre-chorus. Same chords. Back into the chorus. So it's all the same riff. Even in the bridge, they do it. And he'd say, drop down. So just an example, if a riff is great and good enough to where you think it could carry a tune, then just kind of alter up your picking or your muting or whatever, and it can, it can carry the song. So a great riff, like Mark said, when you know, you know. Next thing here from a buddy of mine, Aaron Selk over on Patreon, he was having some problems with song structuring, how to arrange riffs. And I get a lot of questions about that, like guys asking, how do I know what riff to go to next? How do I know how long to do a riff for? How do I transition it? Or I can't think of another riff to, to go after this big riff and things like that. So first of all, I do have a video where I think it's even called uh, how I build riffs to create songs where I talk about um, in, in great detail my process for that about how I come up with one riff and how I'll put the next riff and how I start thinking about structuring that song. Um, but whether you watch that or not, 
The advice that I give to a lot of people, and I think this is imperative to check out if you're really interested in, in learning about songwriting, and great songwriting is unique to everyone, again, kind of in the eye or the ear of the beholder. What I recommend is take five of your favorite songs, your all-time favorite songs. It could be from one band, it could be from five different bands, it could be a couple songs from one band, a couple songs from another band, anything. Just take those five songs, sit down with some pen and paper, listen to those songs, and just totally dissect and reverse engineer exactly what's happening in those songs. How many verses did they play? How many choruses did they play? How about the intro, the outro, the bridge, transitions, the solo sections, the keys, tempo changes, all that kind of stuff. Pay as close attention as you can to every single part and write that down song by song. And then compare those things between songs. Maybe some, song, some songs you like will have two choruses. Maybe some will have four. Maybe some will have three, all that, and just kind of take the average and put together an outline of what the best things that you like about those songs, what's in them, and what creates the formula for those songs. And then take that information and translate it into your own song. Even try copying it. You can you could take one song, let's take a like Enter Sandman or something, write down exactly what they do in that song, and then use that same formula and put your own riffs in just as a, as a practice. At the very least, what you'll get out of that entire practice is a greater knowledge of song structuring. Whether it's beneficial to you or not personally, you'll be better after you do that exercise than you were before. I guarantee it. Ah, here's one I hear quite often. El Harmy, Rob, I only play guitar in the classical position with it in between my legs and really struggle to play at all the way everyone else does guitar set on the right leg. Am I hindering myself? I wonder this a lot. First, let me say that I was taught in the classical position, which is on your left leg, just like this. And this is what I'm most comfortable with, and this is what I play with, like, all the time myself. If I'm writing, recording, jamming on my own, I'm always on my left leg in the classical position. But for videos, specifically, I go to, I drop drumsticks, I go to my right leg, which I just learned is called the casual position, uh, and that's only because it's better for the camera. It just fits on screen better, especially with close-ups, things like that, because, you know, the screen is wide, wider than it is tall. It's just a lot of the time, especially with close-ups, if you're like this, you can't get the the lower frets here and stuff like that. So, and if you're shooting vertically, what do you got to do then? Like, kind of like this, you know? But anyways, I only play in the casual position just for videos. Every other time I play in the classical position, which is far more comfortable to me, I notice I get I don't get as fatigued a lot of the time in this position, just the way my arm sits or whatever, just because I'm not used to it. I know this is just unique to me or whatever. My arm, I notice, gets tired a lot quicker when I'm doing strenuous stuff. So anyways, I do prefer to play like this. And just one tip I have when I first started out, a lot of the time, so this guitar can just sit comfortably for me like this. I can move around. It doesn't want to fall. But when you're just first trying to learn how to do this, it, it can kind of get awkward. Uh, you know, it'll move around and you may not like it. But I recommend kind of having um, this wing of the guitar like right up against your heart and my arm here is pretty parallel to the bridge where when I'm like this the casual position my arm is more parallel to the strings now I can pull it off no problem but I'm just more comfortable like this with my arm a little more parallel to the bridge and again it just sits like that but what my teacher did for me early on when he first started teaching me is he put something I'm just gonna use this old noise suppressor here he put something under my foot like that that helped keep it up and that made it easier because it's a little more, you know, your legs at a little more of an angle like that to keep it up rather than down and where it may fall. So you may want to try that. Everybody's got something around the house, a brick, um, whatever, I don't know. Um, you know, just put something under there to where it's in a height for you where the guitar can start to sit comfortably and you can get used to playing like this. And then eventually you'll be able to move, remove whatever type of crutch you're using down there to, uh, to keep your leg on and you should be good to go. So. I don't know that playing in casual or classical is hindering your progression whatsoever. It just all comes down to practice, dedication, determination, soul, and just wanting it and doing it. That's what it really comes down to. Jason Carazales, 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 says, yo, Rob, show us how is your pick in holding technique from riffing to solos. Well, my picking technique, I don't believe changes at all from riffing to soloing. It's the same no matter what. Hopefully we can get in there kind of close. So I just hold it between my thumb and index finger with a little bit of the end sticking out there. 
And when I want to do pinch harmonics or more muting or anything like that, I can just bring that in a little bit. That's not something you'll be able to just achieve overnight, but just seeing and hearing about that technique would help a little bit. So when I'm doing a pinch harmonic there, I'm pinching in the pick and my thumb right here is hitting the string directly after the pick, which gives it that harmonic sound. It has nothing to do with your left hand. The left hand just gives the vibrato. But watch. So again, that's just my thumb hitting the pick right, or hitting the string right after the pick. But it doesn't change for soloing. But something interesting, that uh, the homie over on Patreon, James Salmon, uh, was asking me a very similar question about picking, and I thought of something that I thought was quite interesting. So, to go further into my picking technique here, if I'm holding my pick like this, I'm gonna call this the left side of the pick. This is for my eyes, the way I'm looking down, the left side and the right side. I would say that the left side hits the string first. It isn't just straight down, it isn't totally parallel to the string, nor is it perpendicular to the string, but it's slightly curved in a little bit, or angled in. So I'm hitting it, I would say, more with the left side. But what's interesting is that both Matt DeVries from Chimera and original Chimera guitarist Jason Hagar strike it with the right side first. So to me, that technique is super weird, but it works, and what makes it kind of strange and interesting is that we're in the same band, playing the same songs and the same riffs, but yet we have a completely different picking style. So again, they'll pick with the right side first and far more perpendicular to the string. So they're kind of, they kind of dig in like that with that right side, which to me just feels awkward. But it's only awkward because I learned a different way many moons ago. If you're just getting started, you know, it's all about how you learn, just like, uh, if you've never played drums before and you're right-handed, if you start playing left-handed, it'll that's just how it'll be. Oh, Andal's a perfect example. He's a left-handed dude, but he plays drums right-handed because that's just the way he learned. So, all obvious stuff or whatever, but anyways, man, just tight, concise, work on it, work on techniques, work on, um, I'm sorry, practice techniques, practice routines, play to a metronome if you can, get in time and stuff, and that's what will improve your picking. Andrew Waffner. 5304. Hey Rob, what are your top three favorite Chimera songs? Bloodlust, one of my favorites ever. Everything You Love, another one of my favorites. Hey, name the show after it, you know? And then for a third one, that's tough. I thought about it for a sec and some cuts off Resurrection came to mind. Worthless Six, The Flame, uh, Empire. End it all. I, I love all those tunes. Um, but if I just had to choose one gun to my head, I'm going to go with Empire. Empire it is. So Bloodlust, Everything You Love, and Empire on this particular Wednesday afternoon. It may change tomorrow. I don't know. Well, what are yours? Top three. Let's hear them. J. Dennis, 1999. What I'd really like to hear on an AYL. AYL? All you love? This is everything you love, so, but I guess we'll answer anyways. How did this album come out differently? He's talking about my solo album, Magnitude, that came out a few months ago. How did it come out differently than past work you've done? Was working with less members and not having to factor in a vocalist freeing in a way? Like this sounds a bit like Chimera, but it also sounds totally different in an unleashed kind of way. Well, Jay, first of all, thanks for listening. Thanks for everybody who's checked out Magnitude so far. And if you haven't, I really encourage you to do so. It's an instrumental album from and Drum Chimera drummer Andles Herrick and I, um, just like a handful of wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, instrumental tunes. And I would say that the major difference for me between this record and any other record I've made is the vocals. And yes, that made a big difference for a couple reasons from a couple different perspectives. One is that as an artist, I didn't have to present you guys, the audience, with just some vocalist that I chose for you to decide whether you like along with the music or not. It's hit or miss. I could have chosen a vocalist that uh, you guys totally love and the songs would have been way better than they are now or 
a vocalist that you guys didn't like and it could have ruined the songs. So I wanted to do just this one album uh, as an opportunity to just have all instrumental music, just to try one. I, I, I plan to have future solo albums and I plan to have different vocalists on them. And I can picture all the Magnitude songs with vocals uh, as well, no doubt. But I wanted to do an album like that without vocals. So like I said, as an artist, I didn't want to um, impress any particular vocalist on you. I just wanted the music to speak for itself in this case. And the other perspective is from a mixing engineer. It was uh, something that lightened the load a little bit. You know, um, what we do with all these tracks is called multi-track recording. So you're mixing together all the drums, um, you know, instrument by instrument, and, uh, all the guitars, the bass, any samples, you know, keys, synths, atmospheric stuff, all that kind of stuff. You're mixing all that in to one condensed song, you know, for people to enjoy. And having vocals is another huge element to make sound good and to get in the mix and everything. So in a sense, it was a bit freeing to not have to deal with that. I love vocals, I'm a fan of them and everything like that, but it was just one less big thing to worry about uh, in terms of trying to make the music sound great. So those are the two big differences for me with Magnitude. Couple more things I wanted to talk about. Right now, for a limited time, I don't know how long, shipping with my DVD is this whole grip of 10 guitar picks. And I just thought I'd show these off, see what you get. So uh, for those of you who don't know, most of you do, robarnoldworld.com slash store. My DVD autograph ships worldwide free, only $24.99, and usually comes with three free guitar picks. But right now, it's coming with 10. Well, I have this limited run of these. And let's check some of these out here, in no particular order. First one, oh, we just spoke about Magnitude. There's a Magnitude cover pick there. This one. Another one, ooh, throwback reprint of my Chimera themed Jump in the Fire picks. The originals kind of had the year that I had these made back uh, in my touring days, but now I'm just doing the RA logo there, but super cool, part of my Metallica collection. I got the first five albums done like this, plus a couple other ones, Damage Inc. Uh, some other stuff there. You're gonna get a Chimera 20th anniversary uh, pick and there's four different variations of this and you're gonna get one randomly it could be this one Which is Cleveland 2023 or a white version of this or also a different white and red version that has the actual date May 12th or 13th depending on which show from this year um, You're gonna get so there are actually four variations of this um, My personal picks from the show these are the ones that I played live Um, just one of my Rob Arnold World picks there. Little design, playing uh, the RA3 or an RA600 there. Uh, ooh, new Elite Total Destruction picks. I'm stoked on these. That's from my band, the Elite. Ooh, a cool throwback. These are some of the sickest. I like these. I did a reprint of these, the Chimera hates everyone. The possibility of Reason Era picks. Some signatures printed on the back there. I believe me, Matt, and Jim. Ooh, another Metallica throwback. My Kill em All picks. Another uh, Rob Arnold World one there with my motto, Heavy Metal Over Everything. Because when heavy metal means a lot to you, you know, you just gotta find a way to say it, like this. And finally, the Chimera Resurrection Era picks here, which I really liked. That might be hard to see in the light. I don't know, it's green with the gold ink. So again, right now, these are shipping. Oh, and they're also shipping with these big diecast chaos logos. Just kidding, this thing's cool. I just wanted to show this off. Somebody at the reunion shows in May made this for us and gave it to us. I don't know who you are, whoever you are, thanks so much and you did a cool job. I forget what this is called, die cast or die cut or something, but this thing weighs a ton. It's not really shipping with the DVD, just to say that again, to clear it up. I just wanted to show it off, but uh, pretty darn sweet there. Uh, but again, yeah, my uh, 
DVD. Right now, shipping with those 10 picks for a limited time. I can't even say for how long. When they run out, they run out. And when they do, you'll still receive at least three of my custom picks. Could be any of those. But if you're interested right now, like I said, robarnworld.com slash store. Get them while they're hot. And finally, just a couple cool little messages from my Patreon community to give myself a little pat on the back. And I don't know, the, the homie Scott Brady says, Rob, your Patreon is the gold standard of Patreon accounts. I subscribe to several more artists and none of them have had the same content, value, and quality of yours. Since day one, you've been active on the comment section and personal messages. It means a lot, mate. We notice these things and we appreciate it. I really appreciate you saying that, Scott, because like I told you, honestly, I've never even considered that people in my Patreon community subscribe to other creators. That's just something that never occurred to me. It seems obvious after you say it, but I, I, I get the feeling like, like um, a lot of people that join my Patreon community are brand new to Patreon, just like I was when I first, uh, you know, started up on it or anything. So to hear that, to hear that insight that uh, you're part of a community representing lots of different. Uh, creators on there and that mine stands out like that really really means a lot so darn cool so again thank you very much for saying that Scott also another one from Adrian Burroughs here really enjoyed this interview especially towards the end when you were talking uh, your approach to YouTube videos and how you collect content for your releases he's talking about um, an interview I did a couple months ago great musician always in touch with your fans and genuinely care about not only us but the content and music that we receive uh, so just what he's saying there just really means a lot to me that that's appreciated because I do try to work hard on that stuff and put a lot of effort uh, into everything I'm doing. And uh, I know so many of you guys tell me all the time uh, that you appreciate it. And, and I just want you to know that all that stuff really, really means a lot. Um, and if you are interested in checking that out, helping support the channel, which is my livelihood and all that, I'd really appreciate it. Patreon.com slash Rob Arnold World, behind the scenes stuff, early looks at my videos. And there's just a cool community vibe and uh, like, like Adrian and Scott mentioned here. So... Anyways, that's going to wrap up this particular episode here. I appreciate everybody watching, especially if you made it this far. Please give the video a like for me if you liked it. If you made it this far, I'll bet you did, right? And make sure you subscribe to the channel. Of course, that means a lot as well. Don't forget to yeah, just do everything that I asked, okay? Thanks, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.